Some people are rich and many are poor. Some are fortunate and many are not. On the very face of it, that is wrong and unfair and something must be done. Or so you might think until you read the work of our guest today, Dr. Thomas Sowell on Uncommon Knowledge Now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Thomas Sowell has studied and taught economics, intellectual history, and social policy at institutions that include Cornell, UCLA, and Amherst. Now a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, Dr. Sowell has published more than a dozen books, including his newest volume, just published, Discrimination and Disparities. Tom Sowell, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. First question, disparate impact. The legal standard holding that statistical differences in outcomes among groups can be enough to establish illegal discrimination even in the ev absence of evidence of intentional discrimination. That's the concept. Two quotations. One is you, in your new book, Discrimination and Disparities, quote, the disparate impact standard represents a major departure from American legal principles where the burden of proof is usually on those making the accusation, close quote. Here's the second quotation. This is the journalist Lauren Kirchner writing in The Atlantic. Get ready. Attorneys have used the concept of disparate impact to successfully challenge policies that have a discriminatory effect. It's been deployed in lawsuits involving employment decisions, housing, and credit. Over the past several decades, disparate impact has represented an important tool for assessing and, ass and addressing discrimination, close quote. An important tool? Are you persuaded? Oh, I, 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 I am. Uh, the lawyers have made millions doing this. <laughs> right. But Tom, what, about the, what about the notion that we need a disparate impact test because discrimination, particularly racial discrimination, particularly against African Americans, is so deeply embedded in the fabric of this country that people discriminate all the time without even being aware of it. If you're going on that assumption, then you don't need the disparate impact theory. You just simply say what you've just said. The, the, to, to dress it up as the disparate impact theory, uh, uh, the disparate impact theory depends upon the truth of the, the assumptions. I, I might also sure. add that uh, Whenever you uh, look at theory, you see this implicit assumption that, that all of the groups are very similar in their capabilities, what they want to do, and so forth. When you look at facts, uh, you find disparate impacts everywhere. Uh, there's been a story in the Wall Street Journal today about the Irish, you know. Well, you know, if, if, you, take, if you just go back to the 19th century and you take uh, the Irish, the Italians, and the Jews, just to pick three European groups, you know, something like 40% of all the Italian immigrants to the United States returned to Italy. The Irish and the Jews were not going back to anywhere. They were glad they got out of where, where they got out of, and they stayed here. Uh, if you look at things like politics, the Irish were so far more advanced politically than either the Italians or the Jews that for generations, you had Irish politicians representing neighborhoods that were overwhelmingly Italian or Jewish. <laughs> you know, uh, everywhere you turn, my gosh, uh, you, you find, you find the, these, these disparate impacts. And in the book, I go in, into, into nature that you don't find things happening randomly around the world. You find 90% of all the tornadoes in the entire world occurring in one country, namely the United States. And only and as part of the United States, you don't hear about tornadoes in Maine or in uh, the Pacific Northwest. And so, I don't know, think how, how much land area there is in the world, and 90% of them right in this one little place. So reality, so it, the large point here is reality is lumpy and uneven and particular. Yes. And it just doesn't fit the kind of bland, smooth reality that, that seems to be in the, the premise, in the back of the theorist's mind. Yes. All right. Discrimination and disparities. Let's get, let's get the, the underlying argument of the book uh, established here. 
the, I'm quoting you again, Tom. The fact that economic and other outcomes often differ greatly among individuals, groups, institutions, and nations poses questions to which many people give very different answers. At one end of the spectrum, the belief that those who have been less fortunate are genetically less capable. That's the racist argument, essentially. All right. At the other end, the belief that those less fortunate are victims of other people. And that's the argument, let's be, to, for me to put it crudely, that's the argument that liberals or progressives tend to make. Yes. Okay. Although I will say progressives were in the forefront of those putting the genetic argument 100 years ago. Oh, so explain that. For example, uh, Woodrow Wilson was a leader of the progressive movement. Yes. And one of the leading racists of, yes. the, of the day. Oh, see, and, and many people look back and say, well, his racism was just an exception to his liberalism. No, that was the, what progressives were pushing that whole time. And not, and not, and, uh, not, not so much against blacks, because they, they just assumed that blacks couldn't do anything. Uh, but they were pushing it against uh, immigrants from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. And it was they who pushed the ideas that led to the great immigration restrictions of the 1920s. All right. Again, discrimination and disparities. Disparities can reflect the plain fact that success in many kinds of endeavors depends on prerequisites peculiar to each endeavor, and a relatively small difference in meeting those prerequisites can mean a very large difference in outcomes, close quote. Now, you illustrate that point by describing a sociological or psychological experiment that Professor Terman here at Stanford conducted at the beginning of the 20th century or so. Well, it wasn't so much an experiment, it was, it was an empirical study. He, he picked uh, something like 1,500 people uh, who had IQs in the top 1%, and he followed them, or his program did, for a period of more than 50 years to see how they turned out. And so, uh, and what, what I point out in the, in the book is that uh, the disparity is within that narrow range. Uh, the, 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 the top third, for example, had more than 10 times as many postgraduate degrees as the bottom third among people who were all in the top 1%. So there were obviously many other things that had to come together. Right. The other thing was that two people who failed to make the 140 IQ cut cutoff ended up getting Nobel Prizes in physics, as nobody among these 1,500 ever did. Mm -hmm. So obviously there have to be a lot of things come together. And you write, again, I'm quoting you here, Tom, the biggest differentiating factor in that study was family background. Yes. And explain that. Well, the, the ones who were in that top third, they came from families that were more, more educated. The ones who were in that bottom third, something like almost 30% or so uh, had a parent who had dropped out of school before the eighth grade. So it doesn't matter how much brain power you may have uh, you know, if you're not ra raised in a home where people are thinking, where they're doing intellectual things, you, you're not in the same position as someone with the same IQ who, who's, who's in a family right. that has that, uh, that kind of background. So the, so the point is you've got these 1,500 brilliant kids. You mm -hmm. follow them for 50 years. Mm -hmm. And if, if nobody knew anything else about them, they'd say, gee, some of these people are relatively poor and some of these people are relatively unfortunate by mm -hmm. comparison with the others. And Tom Sowell says, well, the genetic argument is ruled out of bounds immediately because they're all brilliant. Mm -hmm. They're all in the top 1% by, in terms of smarts. Yeah. But so is the argument that anybody victimized them. Mm -hmm. The principal factor that accounted for success as opposed to failure or ending up was family background. And that's really not victimization. That's a question of almost cosmic luck. Absolutely. What kind of family? Is that, that's right? Is that yes. right? Okay. This is why I spend so much time on the difference between the firstborn child and the others. Oh, explain that. Well, that uh, I first became aware of this years ago when I got, came across some data on you know, the finalists for the National Merit Scholarship. And in five-child families, that finalist was the, fifth, the firstborn more often than the other four put together. And in four-child families, that firstborn was the finalist more often than the other three, and two child, wherever you do it. Uh, and the only, the only, the only uh, child who does better than the firstborn is the only child. And, and then the other thing is that twins tend to have several points lower average IQ than people who are born one at a time. And so when you put all that together, it suggests that uh, the amount of parental attention a child gets makes a huge difference in the future. I see. But again, you can't 
You, 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 you the argument that. of victimization doesn't really apply there. That's more. Nor does ge genetics. Right. They're, they're born to the same parents and raised under the same roof. Right. All right. The costs of discrimination. Again, the book, Discrimination and Disparities. Quote, too many observers reason as if intentions automatically translate directly into outcomes. And then you go on, you of all people go on to quote approvingly from Friedrich Engels, Karl, <laughs> Karl Marx's co-author in the Communist Manifesto, and you, he, he has this phrase, what emerges, that, that Engels makes the argument, intentions don't matter as much as, quote, what emerges. Yes. You use that, so explain that. Well, what Engels says is that what each person wills is obstructed by everyone else, and what emerges is something that no one wills. Right. And so uh, uh, you can't go from intentions to, uh, to, to results. And as if to emphasize that, I later go into the question of uh, South Africa under apartheid so that we don't get it in, in bogged down in the question of how much racism there is and so forth. Because it's quite, it's un unambiguous. Right. That, uh, state black, policy. Yes, it's state policy. It's the law. Uh, and yet uh, uh, there, are, there, are, there were industries in South Africa under apartheid where there were more blacks hired than whites. In, 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 in occupations where it was illegal to hire blacks at all. And that part, part of the problem that, that the people who were imposing apartheid had uh, was that there's money to be made by hiring black workers. And so whatever the racial views of the employer, he, he's, he's thinking about the money. Right. And uh, so you get all these anomalies. And of course, my, my colleague and friend, Walter Williams, uh, when he, he did research in South Africa uh, for three months, and he lived in an area that was set aside for whites only. So that even in the, in the, in the, in the uh, housing market, you had this kind of thing. And at least one, other, one, uh, one area in South Africa, uh, uh, non-whites were a majority in one of the areas set aside for whites only. And again, it's the cost of the discrimination. And you, right. you get that with minimum wage uh, uh, arguments as well, that if you have a minimum wage, then, the, then that's set above what it, where it would be in, in a free market then that means you're going to have more people applying because there's a higher wage, and there are going to be fewer people hired because of the higher wage. Right. And so you're going to have a chronic surplus of applicants. Right. Now, in a market where there's, say, a chronic surplus of qualified people of, say, 200, uh, and there are 100 uh, blacks, for example, who are qualified, and, and then if the employer refuses to hire all 100 uh, black uh, uh, qualified people, he still has 200 others he can call on, and that's it. He, and right. he's, it's cost him nothing. But if there's no minimum wage uh, now, and there's no chronic surplus, every time he turns away a qualified black person, he has to have someone who's not black, who's also qualified, that he can hire. And he may not be able to find that person. At that price. At that and so price. therefore, the price will have to go up. And so it's costing him. And if, he, and, if the, and if he doesn't raise the price, he's going to have to keep his customers waiting because he doesn't have enough people to do the job. Got it. Got it. So let me, this question of the difference between intentions and what emerges. Yes. Let me, a couple of illustrations from the American experience that you describe in, in the book. In the American South after the Civil War, whites employed a number of measures to keep down the earnings of black workers and sharecroppers, keep them poor. Yes. And yet you write, quote, black incomes in 1900 were almost half again higher than they had been in 1867 to 68. In other words, just after the Civil War, after African-Americans received their freedom. This represented a rate of growth higher than that in the American economy as a whole. Yeah. Just freed slaves mm. improved their material well-being faster than the rest of the nation. Yeah. In spite of laws intended to keep them down. How come? Well, it wasn't so much laws in this case, it was uh, agreements. Agreements, I'm sorry. And, and many of these agreements simply fell apart because, uh, uh, especially in agriculture, because as the spring comes in, you've got to get yourself a workforce out there to, to plow that ground and plant the, plant the seeds, otherwise there's you no You lose crop. the whole season, right. Yeah, right, and right. so the people who uh, decided they weren't going to stick by the landowners, they weren't going to stick by this agreement, they got, they got the first uh, dibs on, on, on the black workers and sharecroppers, uh, and the others had to take what was left over. Okay. And, and, they, and they got away with a lot of really ve terrible cheating the first year or so, uh, 
But of course, by experience, the guy who was cheated the first year knows that his cousin is getting paid more next door. You don't need to read about that. You don't need anything else. You go down to where your, where your cousin's working. Got it. Got it. Again, discrimination and disparities. Three decades after the end of slavery, laws mandating racially segregated seating and municipal transit vehicles began to be passed in many Southern communities. This didn't happen immediately yeah. after the Civil War. It's toward the end of the 19th century. Municipal transit companies fought yeah. such laws. How come? Yeah, they, they may have had exactly the same racial views as the people who passed the law, but the people who passed the laws paid no price for it. Uh, the people that own the transit companies, uh, see, the, the votes, only whites could vote, but, but whites and blacks could both supply money. Right. And so, so the incentives were very different from the, from the people who own transit companies than, than they were for politicians. Got it. One final example of this difference between intentions and what actually emerges, the reality on the ground. Housing right here in Northern California. Mm. Beginning in the 1970s, as you explain in the book, San Francisco and other communities right here in Northern California began enacting building restrictions in the name of protecting the environment, mm. open spaces, protecting the environment, and so forth. By 2005, the black population in San Francisco was reduced to less than half of what it had been in 1970, even though the total population of the city as a whole was growing. Close quote. What happened? Well, as the prices, as, 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 uh, as, as the restrictions on, on uh, housing were put in, then of course that meant the, the growing population was, was not accommodated by a growing amount of housing. Uh, in, in Palo Alto, for example, uh, the prices of housing almost quadrupled in one decade. And it was not because they were building luxury homes, because there was not a single new house built in Palo Alto during that decade. It meant that the existing houses almost quadrupled in price. Uh, it, it's amazing how uh, in California, there are people asking, what can we do about the affordable housing price? Build more houses. And, and, and they'll appoint some blue ribbon committee. Now they, <laughs> it's like appointing a blue ribbon committee to go out there and find out why the ground is wet after the rain. You know, I mean, it's really, uh, it's, it's amazing how, uh, I, I think it's almost miraculous the way they can avoid the obvious. So Tom, if we were to apply the disparate impact standard mm. to the question of the legal of the building regime, the legal building regime in San Francisco, we would be forced to conclude that the devout liberals of San Francisco <laughs> had enacted a soft version of Jim Crow. Uh, absolutely, but, but uh, they don't seem to ever get around to applying the dis disparate impact theory in those cases. Okay. The great retrogression. This may be the biggest contrast between intentions and what emerged. Mm. And that is the way that circumstances for African Americans were starting to improve and then turned around. Poverty, mm -hmm. discrimination and disparities. Quote, the plain fact is that black, the black poverty rate declined from 87% in 1940 to 47% in 1960 prior to the expansion of the welfare state that began in the 1960s under the Johnson administration. There was a far more modest decline in the poverty rate among blacks after the war on poverty began, close quote. How could that have been? Well, it, it, could, be, it could be because uh, the things that they thought was, were going to help did not help, and in many cases made things much worse. Uh, one would be the welfare state, uh, which provide, and, and the other would be things like minimum wages, which just price people out of their jobs. It's amazing how that simple concept never seems to get through to so many people. Mm. All right. Crime. And in this case, you're writing not only about African Americans, but about low-income people generally. In the United States, murder rates, rates of infection among, with venereal diseases, and rates of teenage pregnancies were among the social pathologies whose steep declines, declines were suddenly reversed in the 1960s. Nowhere was rampant violence and other social pathology as common among low-income people in the first half of the 20th century when they were more deprived as in the second half, when the welfare state had made them better off in material terms, close quote. Again, it's not the intention of anybody mm -hmm. enacting the welfare state to cause increases in violence, mm. but it happened. Yes. What was the disconnect between intentions and what emerged? 
Oh, heavens, uh, they, they, they misdiagnosed the causes of things, and therefore uh, they misdiagnosed the effect uh, to, to, to expect. For example, in the case uh, of uh, venereal diseases, sex education was introduced on a mass basis in the 1960s, and when the arguments for doing it were, one, to reduce the level of, uh, of, of venereal diseases and of uh, teenage unwanted pregnancies, uh, and both those things had been going down on their own. That is, uh, and by 1960, the uh, rate of infection for venereal diseases was something like half of what it was in 1950. And then they, they bring in the sex education, and it turns around and shoots up. Among blacks, uh, and the homicide rates among black males declined by 18% in the 1940s, by 22% in the 1950s, and then skyrocketed in the 1960s, wiping out all that progress. And they, they had a different view of the world, and their view just did not meet the test of time. Mm. One more instance of this kind of retrogression, the family. Again, discrimination and disparities. As of 1960, this one, I just find this one heartbreaking. As of 1960, two-thirds of all black American children were living with both parents. That declined over the years until only one-third were living with both parents in 1995. Among black families in poverty, 85% of the children had no father present, close yeah. quote. So it's not the legacy of slavery, slavery that destroys the African-American it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the legacy of the welfare state. And by the way, we see Ill illegitimacy rates rising among everybody. Yeah, and, and in other countries. And, mm. you know, the, the, the very same thing in England. Uh, and, and what's the mechanism? Why does the welfare state dissolve the family structure? For one thing, uh, it makes it unnecessary for fathers to uh, support their, their, their offspring. And in fact, it makes it counterproductive in many cases. A very poor man who, who might be able to support his family realizes his family will be better off without him. But on the other hand, someone who's st strictly irresponsible, either the man or the woman or both, now pays no price for being irresponsible. The, the taxpayers pay the price. And actually, the, the harm done to the taxpayers, which is serious, still is not, com not comparable to the harm done to the, to the families, especially the children. To the kids. Yeah. yeah. Um, Moynihan was, was uh, excoriated for pointing this out. 1965 uh, the Moynihan, Moynihan Report. report. That's right, yes. the Moynihan Report. What, and and what, what is so, people that took this as a, as a way of uh, putting, putting down blacks, what they don't understand was that one, Moynihan was a scholar who knew that his own group, the Irish Americans, had that very same problem at the beginning of the 20th century. And more importantly, Moynihan's own father deserted the family when he was 10 years old. Oh, I didn't know that. He and his brother were out shining shoes in Times Square and Central Park to try to bring in some, a few pennies to help, help the, keep the house going. And so where they'd been living in this wonderful suburban area, suddenly they were in a very rough neighborhood and they were shining shoes in, in Times Square to try, to try to make ends meet. And so he understood that this was one heck of a problem that, that people should be warned about. And he was simply excoriated. Discrimination and disparities. Much of the social retrogression that took place is traceable to the central tenet of the prevailing social vision that unequal outcomes are due to adverse treatment of the less fortunate. Yeah. Okay. So grant that argument that they're not paying attention. They're not, they're not squaring up, attempting to square up intentions with what emerges. Yeah. But here's the bit that's still baffling to me. You mentioned the Moynihan Report where uh, his, his central finding was, again, the breaking down of the black family, mm -hmm. and the out-of-wedlock birth rate then was 25%. Now it's over 70%. By the way, yeah. it's over 30% among whites now. Yes. That was more than 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. A half century of failing to, to try to align intentions with results? What is this willful? Why is it that we still have this prevailing social vision that seems not only not to ask what are the results, are our fine intentions actually achieving the ends we wish for, but almost refuses to look at the massive evidence to the contrary. It was counterproductive. So what's going on? Partly what's going on among professional politicians is that 
it can be the end of a whole career to admit that you were wrong. Imagine you're president and you send men into battle in a war and they get wiped out and you say, you know, we really didn't have to fight that war. Uh, <laughs> that, that is not something you're going to say. It's something you're not likely to say to yourself. There'll be a thousand rationalizations and the ability of the human mind to rationalize is just phenomenal. All right. Marx and the Kids. The most spectacularly successful political doctrine in the 20th century was Marxism, based on the implicit presumption that differences in wealth were due to capitalists growing rich by keeping the workers poor through yeah. exploitation. And what was wrong with that assumption? Well, it's, 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 it sounded good like so many others. But, but again, and you speak as a former Marxist. You were a yes, Marxist. Oh, for, yes. You considered yes. yourself a Marxist yes, for, for yeah, some years. Oh, during, during the McCarthy era, by the way. <laughs> uh, Tom but I, had, I, I was swimming against the stream. <laughs> uh, but but uh, I, the, it simply was never put to any test. Now, the test I suggest there is a simple one, but it is a test. And, and if it's true that, that uh, the, the rich are rich because they're keeping the poor poor, then in a country with lots of billionaires, you usually correspondingly have great amounts of poor people. But if you, could, but if you compare the actual data, uh, there are more billionaires in the United States than in Africa and the Middle East put together. And yet the standard of living in, in, uh, of the poor in the United States is higher than that of people in, in, the, in, the, in Africa and the Middle East. So by, the, by that simple standard, it just doesn't hold up. There are problems with the theory. A recent YouGov survey, the proportion of baby boomers, that's my group, who hold favorable views of communism is just 4%. The proportion of millennials, that's my kids and your grandkids, who hold favorable views of communism is 19%. Yes. Roughly one in five young Americans now holds a favorable view of communism. What do you do with that datum? Well, I, I think I, I, I get very pessimistic. Uh, I, the, more recently, during the election, all this enthusiasm for Bernie Sanders was taking place while people in Venezuela, under a socialist government, with lots of oil. A rich well, country, a, sh a rich in natural resources country. Rich in natural resources country, was starving. They were breaking into, into grocery stores to, to get desperate to get food. They're, they're, they're going into other countries to try to find something to eat. Uh, and, 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 it, and, and the two things never came together. I mean, they saw socialism as an idea. Socialism has always been a wonderful sounding idea. It's only when you put it into practice that you discover that there are real problems. All right. um, Tom, when you were writing your column, every so often you would publish a column in which you were, you described your column as random thoughts on the passing scene. Last segment here, let's do a few random thoughts on the passing scene, <laughs> all right? Listen to this list. The Thomas Sowell Reader, 2011. Intellectuals and Race, 2013. A new edition of your classic work, Basic Economics, in 2014. Wealth, Poverty, and Politics, 2015. And now, 2018, Discrimination and Disparities. And do you know what I just did? I just listed the books you've published since turning 80. <laughs> Tom, you haven't had anything to prove to anybody for at least three decades. Mm. What keeps you at it? Why do you work so hard? Well, I I'm don't happy know. you do, you understand, but why do you? Well, I don't work nearly as hard because I, 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 dis, I discontinued the column. Uh, I, I did that after spending some time in, in Yosemite with a couple of uh, photo buddies. And I realized that in those four days, we hadn't watched a single news program. We hadn't seen a single newspaper. I said, this, this is the life. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't need to be watching because most of the foolish things that are said on these programs were said 20 and 30 and 40 years ago and refuted 20 and 30 and 40 years ago. By you, quite often. By me, but by many other people. I see this thing about well, women get only X percent of what men get for doing the same job. And there are studies, including studies done by women who, who, have, who, who have the courage to do these studies, more so than men do, uh, uh, showing that, no, as, as you hold various things constant, 
this, this, whatever that percentage is, begins to shrink and shrink, and in some cases reverse, that among uh, uh, academic uh, uh, men and women, in the study that I did 40 years ago now, uh, uh, if you took never married women in academia, they had a higher income than never married men. And the da a data from not only from my studies, but a number of other studies show that the real difference is between women who are married and who become mothers and everybody else. That, uh, and, and men who, who get married uh, have higher incomes than men who have same education, age, and so forth, right. who don't get married. And women who get married uh, have lower than women who don't get married. And of course, this is because of the division of labor within the home. Right. And uh, uh, so, there are so many statistical uh, mess ups when they do these comparisons, I can't even get into them all. <laughs> But you're happier when you're not reading the news. Absolutely. But at the same time, you're also happier when you're working on a book. Yes, when I can go out there and get the hard data uh, and, and find out what's really happening. Got it, got it. Um, this is the mandatory subject, Donald Trump. During the presidential campaign, you wrote a column, this is when you still had your column, that appeared under, under the headline, Choose Trump, He'd Be Easier to Impeach. <laughs> and you wrote that voters faced a choice between, I'm quoting you, two out-of-control people, one of whom is going to be president. And you said since Hillary Clinton would be the first woman chief executive, she'd be very difficult to impeach, but Trump would be easier to kick out, so vote for Trump. Uh, now that he's been in office for a year, what do you make of him? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. <laughs> oh, gosh. You know, uh, let me say that, that just recently Walter Williams sent me a, a, a video of Donald Trump in his mid-30s being interviewed. Uh, and so I've had to uh, back off on one of the things I've said, which is that uh, Trump is someone who has simply never grown up. He was very grown up in his mid-30s. <laughs> Speaking of retrogression. And, uh, and it's scary because how many people are more mature in their mid-30s than they are at age 70. All right. And, and given the trend line, how optimistic should we be about his uh, becoming more grown up as time goes on? All right, all right. But in terms of, of the people he's put, uh, surrounded himself with, I think on the whole, they're a better bunch than either of the last two presidents had. So he has very good people. I think of uh, Jim Mattis at the uh, uh, defense. Yeah, uh, but 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 other people are around him, and the question is: Is he going to listen to them? All right. Let me play you a brief excerpt of Donald Trump himself. This is from the State of the Union address this past January. This will be my first time to hear. It's something I'm very proud of. African American unemployment stands at the lowest rate ever recorded. Hey! <laughs> okay. Oh my. He 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 produces a statistic. Maybe the statistic isn't quite right either. Maybe no. It is. It is. It is. Yeah. And there you see a shot. You see Republicans standing and applauding, and there you sh see a shot of Democrats who are sitting on their hands, including many members of the Black Caucus. Yes. In Congress, what do you make of that? That, as with so many other groups around the world. The leaders of groups that are lagging are often themselves the, one of the biggest handicaps of those groups because they have to depict the problems uh, in ways that will allow them to play the role of rescuers. And so there'll be no talk about how you can do this or that for yourself. There'll be talk about what we can get the government to deliver for you. And usually that, that, that's a lot of words and, and things that have bad effects. And that's true not only with blacks in the United States, it's true of uh, people in uh, lower income people in England and, and elsewhere. So it's actually dangerous for, pe for, for less fortunate people to turn to politics oh, yes. as, a, as a form of redress. No, no question about it. If you look uh, in the United States or around the world, you think of spectacularly successful people you can almost never name any prominent leader to whom that success can be attributed. I mean, who, who, who has made the, what Asian leader has, has made, has made Asians successful? Well, well, the answer would be Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore. Yes. Yeah. What do you do with that example? 
Uh, that's the outlier. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> but he didn't do that by by um, championing their cause in Malaysia. He did it by taking charge of Singapore itself independently and creating free markets. That's right. Uh, but but he but he, he never had to tell them that their problems were all caused by somebody else. And that's the first thing a quote leader has to do if he wants to remain a leader of some group that's lagging. I mean, you can look, you, I'm always amazed at countries that split apart, where the, the poorest part of the country is the part that wants to split apart. I mean, the Slovaks are the ones who... who, who uh, they wanted to break away from Czechoslovakia. That's right. Uh, in, uh, in Pakistan, it was the East Pakistanis who were poorer than the West Pakistanis who broke off to, to form uh, Bangladesh. All of that helps the leaders. It does not help the people that they're leading. All right. So politics actually provides perverse incentives. Yes. For, for, particularly for the, for the less fortunate. Yes, absolutely. All right. Tom, reparations. We began by talking about disparate impact, the idea mm. that discrimination is so deeply embedded in the American experience that it can take place even in the absence of an intention to discriminate. Mm. So this argument which is that there's something, some basic flaw or sin that's still with us comes up in the case for reparations. Mm. Longish quotation, but it's, it sets something up. But from Ta Nahisi Coates in an article in The Atlantic entitled The Case for Reparations. White supremacy is not merely the work, work of hot-headed demagogues, but a force so fundamental to America that it is difficult to imagine the country without it. And so we must imagine a new country. Reparations is the price we must pay to see ourselves squarely. The wealth gap merely puts a number on something we feel but cannot say, that American prosperity was ill-gotten and selective in its distribution. What I'm talking about is more than recompense for past injustices. What I'm talking about is a national reckoning that would lead to spiritual renewal. Close quote. And Tom Sowell makes what of that? <laughs> uh, I, I, well, it, explain, it, it, it tells me that I mean, I've made the right decision not to read the Atlantic for, a, for decades. Uh, slavery is a very big subject. I, I have in my home an entire bookcase of nothing things, but books about slavery in various parts of the world and various times of history. And the sad fact is that Slavery has been a universal institution for thousands of years, as far back as you can trace human history. And what we're looking at is if slavery is something that happened to one race of people in one country, when in fact the, 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 the spread of it was around the world. In, in 1776, which is when Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nation, as mm -hmm. well as when the United States got started, he said that Western Europe is the only place in the world where there is no slavery. Uh, and even in the Western, even the Western Europeans had vast numbers of slaves in the Western in, Hemisphere, yes. but not in Western Europe itself. And so if you're going to have reparations for slavery, it's going to be the greatest transfer of wealth back and forth uh, and, 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 and cross-hauling, as they say in, in the railroads, because the, the number of, of whites, for example, who were enslaved in uh, North Africa by the Barbary pirates exceeded the number of Africans enslaved in the United States and in the American colonies before that put together. I know, but nobody is going to North Africa to ask for reparations because nobody is going to be fool enough to give it to them. Uh, here we have, we have intellectuals who can, who can imagine a different history from the rest of the world, even though it's so similar to the rest of the world. Tom, would you close our program by reading a passage from your marvelous new book, Discrimination and Disparities? It's about people who want to redress the past. The only times over which we have any degree of influence at all are the present and the future, both of which can be made worse by attempts at symbolic restitution among the living for what happened among the dead who are far beyond our power to help or punish or avenge. Any serious consideration of the world as it is today, around us today must tell us that maintaining common decency 
much less peace and harmony among living contemporaries is a major challenge, both among nations and within nations. To admit that we can do nothing about what happened among the dead is not to give up the struggle for a better world, but to concentrate our efforts where they have at least some hope of making things better for the living. Dr. Thomas Sowell, author of Discrimination and Disparities, thank you. Thank you. For Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution, I'm Peter Robinson. I'd love to keep you for, but you need to go home and start your next book, Tom. <laughs>